um, okay, we've got a machine that's working. How are we gonna fund this machine? The funding question is actually a really easy one. It's a really simple, dispassionate waterfall of different funding options, right? It's what we call the capital stack. If you look in our blog, we have a, a very well-read um, article post a couple of years ago called the capital stack, how to optimize user acquisition. It, it's really just this, right? So you've got this machine that's working. So let's start off at the very top of the stack, if you're able to get credit terms, right? If you're on invoice financing where you don't have to pay for 30 days or whatever from Facebook or Google or TikTok or whoever, you should totally use that first because that's effectively free money. You could look at it as this is a, a risk transfer, an LTV recovery risk of transfer from you onto them. Now, the reason they give you credit is because they want to keep you spending more money on the platform over time, just like any kind of trade credit. If you're being really diligent, it's effectively free money and you should use that until you cap out the credit line or you need additional cash to, um, to, to pay it back. So once you've exhausted that, you go down to the next one, which is your cash of the bank. So if, for example, I've got an, another game or an app that's throwing off a bunch of free cash flow that's sitting in the bank earning half a percent a year or one percent a year, then if you can take that and deploy it into ads and make more than return you're getting in the bank, then rationally you should do it. There's a bit of a distinction here between the money that you have from a free cash flow from a, from a game or an app or something and let's say the money you've just raised from a venture capital fund, right? So just because you've got 5 million bucks in the bank sitting there doing nothing, if that money is earmarked for products and building teams and hiring team members and so on, then you don't want to be tying that up in user acquisition. So um, I'm going to I'm going to put an asterisk against um, the, the cash at the bank. The next one, and to be honest, a lot of people don't don't really focus on this, but we saw it a few years ago where people would try and use the interest-free payment on a credit card in order to fund their user acquisition. Some people did it really successfully, and there are, you know, there are a couple of people I know who'll probably never pay for another flight with their own <laughs> money because they've earned so much money and, and and made the points from it. But increasingly this has gone because there are too many factors, right? The interest-free period when it needs to be paid, it, it was it was causing too much of a, a stop start in in how UA was getting funded. So then below that, you go to lines of credit, right? So you look at the type of credit facilities we provide are called revolving credit facilities. And the two things that make up the amount of available credit are, first of all, the amount of money that's trapped up in the payment cycles of the ad networks and the, and the app stores. So that can be anything up to 67 days on iOS. It can be up to 90 days for some of the advertising networks. And so first of all, we look at that and we, we pull in all that data every day and allow you to borrow against it. The second is what we call residual cohorts. So this is basically the way to think about it is if you press stop on all your user acquisition today, how long does it take for most of your users effectively to, to come out of the app or stop paying? So it's this long tail. You can borrow into the long tail. So below that, you get to the next most expensive, more expensive and slightly higher risk, right? So revenue-based loans are some of these guys that say, well, look, I'll, I'll lend you money. You put it into user acquisition and I'll take a share of the revenues until I've been repaid. That's typically, you know, if you look at that versus you know, a revolving credit line, a credit line is based on things that have already happened, right? Either the sale has already taken place or the customer has already been acquired. For revenue loans, this is very speculative and, and effectively a bet on your ability to program user acquisition. So it's more expensive, potentially more risky, both for the lender and also the, the studio. And right at the very bottom of the stack, if the equation is still working and you've exhausted all of these other options, then by all means, go and raise equity to put into it. But essentially, you know, at that stage, you're diluting your own ownership of your business. It's very, very rare to see scenarios now that people people need to raise equity because they've exhausted all, all these other funding options. This is the the, the concept of the capital stack. So it's a, it should be a very simple, dispassionate journey through these different options until you get back to until you get back to your uh, investment equation. So maybe we can flip back onto to my screen, Steve, and I'm going to just show the um, show some of the, the the other parameters behind it. So essentially, and again, if you have, uh, we'll do a little quick tour of the tool. If you want to focus here, the different tabs along the top, you look at LTV and ROAS. So what I want to know here is this is just focusing on my on my journey and my ad spend journey. So I'm breaking even after 25 days. 
anything I can do to get the break-even period shorter is just going to help me grow faster. And then also uh, anything to, you know, to increase that sort of LTV over time. It's going to mean I make more money. It takes me longer to recover it, but it's going to mean I'm going to make more. So what we're then going to look at is basically if you've got th these positive economics and you're looking to borrow to keep fueling the machine, I think the way to think about it is this. Steve, if you and I went to Las Vegas, which in fact we've done before, right? Um, but not mm -hmm. the slots, right? We go find the slots and we find a machine that pays out $2 for every time we put in $1 into that machine, essentially, right? So this is our, this is our money printing machine. Think of it, this is our user acquisition machine. So the question is, we find this machine that pays out two every time we put in one. Question, do you wait 30 days until the next payment cycle before you go back to that machine? No, you want to hit hit that machine as hard as possible until what will happen is at some point it will stop it won't pay out anymore in which case you need to leave that machine and stop putting money into it so slightly crude example but this is this is essentially it so let's say now that you have to you have to you're, you're looking to borrow the money to reinvest in something now there's a very simple equation here that comes into play which is you know, what's my cost and what's my return? So we're going to come back to that in a second. And I'm just going to show you the modeling of a cash flow. So again, this is another classic mistake that a lot, a lot of developers make, which is confusing P&L and cash flow, which is an accounting term. So P&L is when you are booking the revenue that every day you're looking at these numbers and stats. That's when you're clocking the numbers in your spreadsheet and you're seeing it booked. That's very different from when revenue actually hits. So, uh, you know, you will have a, you'll have this payment delay, which is going to really impact your business. So what we do here is we model a couple of different things. So we've got this starting balance of a hundred thousand dollars here. If you look at based on these numbers, if you look on day zero, you have the red column as you get, well, either way, you've got a hundred thousand bucks. Now, what we're doing is let's focus on the red line first. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take the 100,000 bucks and we're going to spend it on a linear basis over 60 days. So that by day 60, if you look at the red number here, we've got basically zero. We've spent essentially all of our money on ads. And what we're waiting for is day 67, we're going to get our first payday. So between day 60 and day 67, we go fallow. And then day 67, we get a bump. So in this case, it's an Apple iOS payout. And then what we do is we take all the money we've just been paid and then we allocate it on a next 30 days basis to spend on more UA until we're going to get paid again. So what happens is you see this sawtooth pattern of like, I'm taking my 100,000 budget, I'm investing it as efficiently as I can. And then basically I want basically the day before I get paid, I've exhausted it again. So I'm using it as efficiently as possible. That makes us the, that gives us a spiky cash flow that makes us the red line. And then if you look at the, the cyan line on the top, all this one is doing is to say, well, look, what I'm going to do is every seven days, I'm going to borrow money against my previous seven days of revenue, and I'm going to reinvest it back into more cohorts that I know are ROI positive. So mathematically, I'm going to make more money. And so it enables you. So this is the idea of like, hey, you're paying someone a couple of cents in order to get the dollars to reinvest faster in order to make another dollar. If we go back to the slots example, right? So this is basically, uh, and, and this is how some companies that have used these sorts of financing techniques have been able to grow you know, very substantially. I'm going to say a caveat here because this is not, either raise venture capital or use credit facilities, right? This is always a blend of the two. A decent amount of our deal flow is referred by VC funds saying, hey, we've just seeded these guys $3 million. We don't want them to spend all their money and trap it in the user acquisition cycle. So can you come in alongside and provide this credit facility so that when they get economics that work, then you know they can hit it? And But actually, really, to be candid, some of the best scenarios are where People are bootstrapping. They haven't raised external capital. They've got these economics, and then it just gives them more gas in the tank to grow. So it's basically a you know it can be a, a phenomenally effective way to scale.